Today's discussion is with Dr. Jason Alter, who's a scientist, and he's chief of scientific affairs for exosome diagnostics. Jason has over 20 years experience in testing for predictive value and prognostic testing for prostate cancer, both in tissue-based and urine-based testing. We talked about uh, the different landscapes of what to use, um, things that are probably better than PSA tests for uh, assessing if one has prostate cancer. We talked about the numerous urine tests. Of course, we talked about the exosome test and what exosomes actually are in the body. We talked about um, the problems with PSA testing and why it might be important to test for prostate cancer with things other than anything that involves PSA in the algorithms. Today's interview with jo Dr. Jason Alter on PSA and prostate cancer testing. Let's go. Welcome to the Dr. Geo podcast. I am your host, Dr. Geo where it is my goal to help you with your urological function and how to live better with age. Today, we have the great fortune of having a conversation with Dr. Jason Alter. You already know a little bit about him from the introduction, so we're going to get right to it. Jason, thanks so much for uh, joining us on this podcast. Uh, um, we had a Johan Skag. Is that the right pronunciation of his uh, last name? Yeah. Johan Skog. Skog. Skog, right. I, I figured... Uh, I was off by 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 the accent there. Um, who uh, is a developer of the uh, Exosome DX test? Um, he was not available. He had children, and then they connected me to you, and we had a very nice, lengthy conversation uh, on uh, you know for about <laughs> for about an hour on urine tests for prostate cancer. So, and it, what I thought was interesting from that conversation is that you've been in the game for a long time uh, into the. Um, the tissue game and the liquid biopsy game for a long time. Tell us a little bit about your history. Even, you know, where did you, what, what's your PhD on? Did you, do, did you know you were going to get in this, in this particular specialty? What's the history there for you? Oh, well, thank you. And thank you for having me on. It's a real pleasure to be here today. Um, well, I started actually completely outside prostate cancer. Uh, I have a master's in, Immunoparasitology. I worked with schistosomes many, many years ago. Parasites. I, yes, uh, they're uh, uh, worms that live inside you for for up mm -hmm. to thirty years. But we were more mm. focused on uh, the immune response to to these parasites. Um, and then I have a PhD from from uh, well from Binghamton University in molecular biology, and that was completely unrelated. It was back when cloning genes and doing work with them was considered novel. Um, mm -hmm. And that was a long time ago as well. Um, and then eventually when I went into the uh, work world, I had various roles at, at multiple companies, uh, but always sometimes in the marketing side, sometimes on the technical side, but always with a focus for the deep understanding of the science and the importance of the science behind the various um, offerings that these companies had. And in 2006, I joined my first prostate specific testing organization. And since then, uh, I've been in a number of prostate cancer focused testing companies, specifically companies that roll out advanced testing to help men who are diagnosed or considering, in this case, considering biopsy. But for mm. men who are somewhere in the prostate cancer pathway, uh, and the reason I've stayed here for all these years, and it has been a long time, is because prostate cancer is intellectually fascinating. It's, mm, uh, it's challenging, and uh, it's never boring. Yeah. And at the same Complete, time, you get completely to help a agree. lot of men. Yes. You know, um, you know that um, I am a holistic, uh, a naturopathic, functional medicine doctor, and I, that's my specialty, right? And so, a lot of my colleagues—I mean, j just very few—are doing what I do in that narrow specialty. A lot of my colleagues are like, "How do you? Don't you get bored? And the same thing, prostate and penises all day. Don't you get?" It's like, 
Absolutely not. It is a- so, so fascinating. Always something new to learn. And certainly from a uh, from a holistic perspective, but even the conventional things and the tests that are out there and how you compare them and the data that keeps coming out, that it just makes it fascinating. So I couldn't gr- agree with you more uh, on how fascinating the prostate gland it is I mean, it's a, it's a fascinating uh, little little gland uh, you know a lot of it um it's muscle uh, the gland is muscle so um a lot of people you know i'm 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 at risk of digressing but i am fascinated with that with with that organ um uh, you know so when you talk about you know pelvic pain and things like that you know, it's like any other muscle with stress. You can have you can have a, 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 a the muscle of the prostate that kind of contracts and is constantly you know stressed out as well. Like maybe neck pain or lower back pain muscles. Mm-hmm. Uh, so a lot of people don't know that you can really a lot of pelvic pain is related to just the muscle around the prostate. Well, that's interesting. I don't think I knew that either. Yeah, that's... yeah, no, exactly. Would you say that in two thousand and six the whole uh, interest in s- science as it relates to um, studying tissues of uh, prostate biopsy and p- studying the prostate gland for, to determine prognosis for prostate cancer, urine tests. Is that when it all began, more or less? It, yes, it did. And it was, uh, I think it was a confluence of a couple of different things. First is there was this exciting new approach in prostate cancer in my opinion, this is of course my opinion, um, you know, prostate cancer, men in, in, who are going through prostate cancer management, have always uh, been about 20 years or so behind breast cancer. Um, when yeah. I started in prostate, there was pretty much not a lot of great options which have developed over the years for various reasons. Yeah. Um, and so there was a confluence of new, exciting, innovative testing to help men who are going through prostate cancer. And uh, so there was the science side, but then there was the clinical side. Um, The clinical side was at the time new to me. And um, I found that there was a wide amount of variation in how men were treated for prostate cancer, how they were managed, depending on Mm. who they spoke to, how they were trained. Mm. And so it it was interesting on multiple levels. Yeah, I think even the fact that uh, we know later on, 2012, roughly, when the United States Preventative Task Force said, look, the PSA is not a good screening tool. But even back then, I think we were noticing that, wow, I see low PSAs with uh, you know, men with prostate cancer. And certainly when I, I've seen men with relatively high PSA and no prostate cancer, and they keep biopsying, trying to find, and you know, eight biopsies later is still negative. So, right. you know, we've always noticed and, you know, we, we've noticed it for a while. And, and, then, and then it came to, and there was a, wait a minute, you know, over treatment, over biopsying, all these issues that we have, which I think this is what makes um, these urine tests fascinating. Um, you know, as a, as a holistic practitioner, it's not something, you know, most natural doctors or naturopathic doctors, functional medicine doctors, this is a lifestyle. This is not like, um, um, this is not like, you know, we just, you know, do it and, 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 you know, do it, you know, say it, but don't do it. We, we've lived the lifestyle of what we prescribe. Funny. I was with Jonathan Haas. Um, uh, so he's a MD radio radiation oncologist. We were having this conversation of, he said, do you take all the supplements that I say? Yeah, I, I, I take, I don't take everything that I recommend because it might not apply to me, but I take quite a few. So yeah, this is a life. This is what I do. And this is, you know, this is my life. He says, oh, great. You know, I think I'm going to start radiating my prostate at least once a week, you know, <laughs> to make it my lifestyle. I said, no, 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 no. We, we don't want to do that. We, we don't want to do that. Um, so I say that to say that I've seen thousands of patients after bi- prostate biopsy. And I can honestly say that it's not the worst thing in the world based on what I've seen, but man, I don't want one. No, <laughs> you know, I still don't want one. I've yet to actually <laughs> meet anyone who wants one. Uh, <laughs> you know, it's not exactly you know? when you describe the process to someone, if they don't know exactly what we're talking about, it's uh, there's nothing that sounds appealing about it. And right. 
Yeah. And so, and, and you mentioned the task force, the United States Preventative Service Task Force and around 2012 came out with their original grade D recommendation for PSA screening. Um, and as a result of those grade D dis- meaning for the audience, grade D meaning that it's not a good, um, that PSA was just not, uh, that we should do without PSA for, as a screening tube for prostate cancer. Yes. And I think that, you know, uh, not to get too deep into the reasons, their reasoning, uh, I think that, you know, we understand that, um, PSA has limitations and we've been using it as a screening tool. And tests like the exosome DX prostate or epi test, as it's colloquially called, uh, were developed specifically to try to bring some additional clarity to the non-specificity of PSA. And that's why there's a whole mm-hmm. class of these tests out there now uh, for early detection to help make biopsy decisions, uh, because we understand that, you know, in less than 10 nanograms per mil of PSA, even though it's considered elevated, it's also known as the mm-hmm. PSA gray zone. And it's really hard to understand whether that PSA is relevant to cancer of any type, let alone concerning cancer. That's correct. Uh, it's it's a it's a prostate. Um, it tells you something about the prostate, not so much as it relates to prostate cancer. I think the highest PSA I've ever seen with a negative biopsy is about a 20, 21. Right. And, and this is with multiple negative biopsies. So that's the highest I believe I've seen um, where they've had multiple biopsies, um, even targeted uh, MRI guided biopsies, and they were, uh, uh, they were negative. Um, so that being said, right, so part of what I do clinically is I, I, I'm, I'm always assessing my own biases. And because the patient doesn't care about my bias, they just want whatever's best for them. That being said, if they need a prostate biopsy, I said, look, we, we've done everything. These are all the tools we have to assess if you actually need a biopsy. And I think you do. One of those tests that I use are, uh, are urine tests. Um, and I've used quite a few. I've used a PCA3, I've used Select MDX, and I've used, of, co- of course, the, uh, the Exosome DX test, which is the company that you uh, are affiliated with. How do these urine tests work? And one of the things that make it interesting with these tests is that they don't use P- any PSA molecule. So if we're saying, all right, PSA is a problem, then we don't want to use this PSA uh, value in any algorithm to come up to and determine whether or not the, the, per, the patient needs a biopsy or not. So what's, what, t- tell us, uh, give us a little uh, uh, background on these urine tests for prostate cancer and um, how they work. Sure. So I, I think you put your finger right on the heart of what's really most important. And you said that PSA, you know, because we know it's so nonspecific is not, part of these tests, but the the reality is, uh, without mentioning names, that almost all the tests that are currently commercially available actually are based on clinical features, including PSA. They all drive the result, even if they layer on something else like a few specific markers, genomic markers. Um, You know, we can mention names. We're not, I I don't think we're... um we are shaming or, uh, or talking critically too critically or, or badly, let's say about these tests. The 4k score is one of them is a blood test and I've used it. And if that's all you have for whatever reason, it, it, it does seem to be better than just PSA alone. And I've used it successfully for a long time. But when I've had a patient who clearly has a big prostate, so now that value it, uh, it you know, they would have a very high PSA from a big prostate. Somehow in their algorithm and their calculations, that's included in that. So then that gives us a false, a false positive. Um, and that's my, that would be my, uh, my, my argument against such a test. Um, though I think, again, I think that um, it is, if that's all you have, then it's a, it's a better test than just PSA. Right. And I, and I want to be clear, I'm just trying to be factual. So Um, You know, when I work for a company and I come from the prostate cancer tissue uh, testing world, as we said, uh, what's important to me when I represent the science and then and I'm from the science and the clinical side is that 
one of the things that's important is that the test independently provides a lot of value. And so the epi test uh, or the exodx prostate test um, doesn't have any clinical features that drive the results. So in other words, you could, if, if regulations allowed, which they don't, you could send in a, a blank vial of urine without any paperwork or any documentation about what's going on, and you could get a result because it's really nothing more than the expression of three genomic markers we capture in the exosomes in the urine. All the other clinical tests that were available that you're mentioning, when you look at their data uh, closely, are really driven mostly by the clinical feature sets. And that's why yeah. that's the big difference. I think it's really critically important because you already have clinical information you're making risk assessments on that when you use a risk assessment tool, that it provides additional value. And that means that it's independent of the information you already have. That's, that's my perspective. Right. right. So the PSA in this case for, if you, if you, um, um, if you have a PSA of a, a, a you know fifty two year old man PSA of uh, seven um, that you already have that clinical va- information that that says okay and you include that information into uh, the four K score which is and it's not just to focus on them I think the Phi score I know less about Phi than I know about four K because uh, it's not we're not we're not allowed to use it in New York it's not it hasn't given uh, FDA approval here or local approval. Um, here in New York. But I think it's a similar process where some of the PSA value is involved in that algorithm. So then that clinical scenario, um, that clinical information is part of the overall sure. calculation to come it, up with a number. Right. And the and the 4K test, I would agree with your earlier statement that, you know, anything's better than PSA. We've set the bar here mm-hmm. with PSA mm-hmm. low. And anything that you're using is going to be better than PSA. And having said that, you know, when you look at some of the other tests, uh, for instance, we mentioned 4K. 4K is primarily driven by the total PSA, the number that you already have, plus the percent free PSA. That's information in, uh, when you look at their studies, Um, if you look at some of the other tests you've mentioned, uh, such as, for instance, Select DX, um, you know, a large chunk of that answer comes from clinical features. And so, and, and you find the same thing, by the way, when you go to the tissue-based world uh, for prostate cancer, where Gleason score is a large component of a number of tests. Uh, so I, I think it's really important and helpful to doctors and to patients is to get that completely separate perspective to sort of triangulate what you already have from clinical with a specific a test, whether it's genomic or it's proteomic or whatever it is, that is not not integrating clinical features unless unless the clinical features and the genomics together are collectively much, much better than either one alone. But that's not the case of what we're talking here. I think right. in, in most of these cases, the clinical features are driving most of the answer. You mentioned several things when you talked about... Um uh, exo uh, DX test and how it works. You, me- you mentioned that there's exosomes that have uh, three DNA uh, uh, mar- biomarkers or RNA biomarkers or both. You can clarify on that. And first of all, let's start with, I remember exosomes back in, I even taught anatomy and physiology for a lot of college level. So I, I'm actually fascinated. W- what's an exosome? <laughs> let's start there. Sure, and that's great. And exosomes weren't, di- you know, weren't were unknown really uh, when I went to school, uh, as as a lot of things were that are you know currently used today. Um, but exosomes are small bilayer, you know, membrane bilayer vesicles that are shed by every cell that we know about, and that's not just in men and women; that's in animals. That's mm. in um, uh, small organisms, uh, ticks, for example. When ticks, I know that's a big thing in the Northeast that come originally from mm-hmm. Connecticut. Um, when ticks mm. bite people, they are injecting exosomes among a variety of other things. Um, and, and those exosomes can contain, for example, viruses. 
Um, mm-hmm. So exosomes are so these on, like little bubbles that that so the cell com- like little bubbles. Let's just say so that the uh, listener has a visual. Sure. Actually, that's how you see it in textbooks sometimes. Um, and I know it's not so you know, it's not exactly how it is. Like little bubbles that come out the cell with different material inside the cell. Oftentimes, these exosomes, these little bubbles, they have like waste material. They can have anything. What what are, what are all the things that these exosomes sure. can have in them that the cells and, bring and out? When exosomes were first reported on in the, I believe it was in the 80s, it was originally thought for, for at least 10, 20, maybe 20 or years that they were just junk, that they contained waste mm-hmm. products that were shed outside the cell. But we now know that exosomes, it's not mostly a waste function. It's a cell-to-cell communication function where exosomes are shed from one cell in the body and then can travel long distances and and then release their contents into another cell and therefore provide direction to a distant cell. So Mm -hmm. exosomes contain RNA, DNA, proteins, fats, lipids. They're actually miniature representations of the cell that shed them. And mm-hmm. uh, in textbooks now, there were four original classical methods of cell-to-cell communication, such as hormone signaling. Now there's a fifth one. I used to say someday your children will have that in textbooks, but I've been corrected by medical students who say that they learn about these in textbooks. And that's actually <laughs> how exosomes was founded uh, by Dr. Skog that you mentioned early on in the, in, in the broadcast. Dr. Skog actually is one of the top leaders in exosome science in the world and Mm. uh, published a seminal paper in Nature in 2009 that actually helped jumpstart interest in exosomes. And right now, there's probably at least 30 or 40,000 papers a year published on exosomes. Mm. And this is a case here where we, uh, in the commercial side, usually academics lead the science And then companies follow behind. Here, what you actually have is a company that's leading the science in exosomes, and actually academics are following what we're doing because we're doing a lot of cutting-edge exosome-related science. I've noticed for a while, and when I give a talk at uh, uh, Integrative Naturopathic Oncology, they've been using um, CTCs, uh, so liquid biopsy, CTC, so... uh, 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 circulating tumor uh, cells. Circulating tumor cells, right? For a long time, right? And uh, and way and, and, and for for all types of cancers, right? And I wasn't so then as the prostate cancer quote unquote expert that they deemed me to be. I said, well, how, what's the role here? I, said, I have no idea. This is before exosome. This is before anything. I, said, I, I don't know. I don't know the relevance of that test for prostate cancer or what do I do with that information? If there's something there, they were using labs in Germany because it wasn't allowed here. I remember, uh, I'm talking maybe 10 years ago, 12 years ago. Uh, now we, we, you know, now we, there's labs in the U S and of course for prostate cancer specific. So it's fascinating how things have evolved, uh, within the last several years you've mentioned. So then, so we have these little bubbles of exosomes that the cells, um, they kind of uh, push out of them, and prostate cancer cells, when they secrete these bubbles, they have specific genes. You, me- you so you mentioned PCA three. You mentioned two others, right? So, sorry, go ahead. Uh, no, no, that's fine. Um, actually, you could take. So, what th- the names actually don't matter because we. I don't think we can. We, we but you, but what PCA three is actually fascinating. That's in there because that was his own test that, or it still exists as his own test that right. we used to do. Actually, it was probably the first urine test for uh, to the uh, for for prostate cancer screening that I've used was PCA three. It was the best out there. Um, and then we noticed that um, it wasn't too. Uh, sensitive or specific to um, the kind of cancer that we care to. So for the audience, in you know, prostate cancer is not that we're we're not trying to find every prostate cancer. So there's most people that have low risk prostate cancer, which will never kill them. We're not interested in finding that. We're interested in finding the more aggressive type that where now you should get a biopsy and perhaps get treated. What we saw with PCA3, there was a lot of um, Gleason 6s and so forth. So we know now that we so. A is 
what's the story with that PCA3 as a standalone urine test? And B, how is it incorporated as an exo test where the value is better than just PCA3 alone? Sure. And, and great question. First, let me just say that, you know, we're measuring three specific gene, the expression of three genes, but those are not the only genes there. We have the ability, uh, not to go too far off topic, to do full transcriptome profiling on 15 mils of urine. What that means is uh, for the audience that all the genes are represented in the exosomes that we collect from these fluids. So we can actually look at the expression of every one of the, the use whatever number you want, 25, 26,000, 30,000 uh, genes that are in the, uh, the human genome are, mm. we, can ex- we can capture that in the exosomes from the urine. So we're only mm. looking at three of those thousands of genes. And the three that we look at include PCA3 that you mentioned, uh, because that is secreted by, uh, uh, by prostate cells, uh, SBDEF, which is a transcription factor, and ERB. Um, and what the, those three genes were selected because in combination, they are associated when we have genes expressing or, or producing more RNA for those three genes, uh, they're associated with the probability of higher grade cancer. So what we're trying, higher grade cancer, as you just mentioned, that we're interested in is Gleason 7 or higher cancer that might be concerning for patients to understand that they have and then to be uh, evaluated and potentially treated. Um, We're not looking for uh, the low-grade, grade group 1, Gleason 6 cancers, which today uh, there's been a paradigm shift. We know we we mostly watch those patients, um, depending on where right. you go. So we're, we're interested in telling you with this test, um, which patients you will, you could safely avoid a biopsy because they have an elevated PSA and your likelihood of finding a Gleason seven or higher cancer on biopsy would be quite low. And the way we do that is through the, the three gene expression that we, we capture these exosomes, uh, we break them open and then we measure the expression of these three genes. We translate it to a score, which goes on to a report for your clinician to discuss with you as the patient. You mentioned PCA3. Right. Um, you know, one of the drawbacks of the original PCA3 was that you had to do a vigorous prostate massage. That's right. And I, th- and I, th- I think it's really, that's an important distinction. What's the value of exosomes per se? Exosomes actually consolidate it in it, at large levels the RNA and the proteins from these cells. And that's why there's mm-hmm. no digital rectal exam required with the exosome test, as there are with most of the other commercial early diagnosis or early cancer detection assays. And that's because they require digital rectal exams to either release enough genetic material into the urine so they could capture it. Sometimes it's part of their algorithm, whether you have a a positive or negative digital rectal exam. But we don't require that because the exosomes are a great platform for amplifying the signals that we collect in the urine. And that's why the original PCA3 test is actually, its value is significantly enhanced now because you can do the. You can have urine collected at home with no DRE, um, and still get an answer. So, is the PCA three test uh, no longer in existence? Is just an exosome test that includes PCA three now? No, I believe that PCA three is still commercially available from another company. It's been out there. For, as yeah, you I haven't. I have no time. idea. I haven't used them forever in in a very long time uh, because of you know because of I think science has evolved uh, a bit. Right. Uh, no, I think um, it's still available. Yes. Yeah. Okay. So we have that. So we. So so you know. Again, there. You know, I guess the, it's it's a bit of common sense. You know. So you have a PCA three alone, and then you have the PSA PCA three that's involved in um, as one of the uh, genetic markers that are looked at with an exosome. What are so? What is Select MDX doing? So we know that Select MDX um, requires a prostate massage prior to uh, urinating in a cup to free up some of these exosomes. What are the um, 
Are they also looking at exosomes or is that a whole different thing altogether? No, they look at uh, tests like Select and Select DX in particular uh, are looking at a combination, as I said before, of clinical information as well as two specific genomic markers. Um, I Don't quote me, but I think one is called DLX1 and one is HOCC6, I believe. But, mm-hmm. but in addition to those two, uh, they do, and the reason they do a DRE, I believe, is because they have to, for two reasons, they have to do that to collect enough inf- uh, material, but also the DRE status, whether you consider something positive or negative on DRE, is part of their algorithm, as is PSA, as is, I believe, age, and whether this is their first initial or a They've had a prior negative biopsy, right? So all those. I, I, features, I, I remember yeah, filling out the paperwork there. It, it does ask you, you know, nodule or no nodule on on the on the on the prostate exam. So right. and, so that's and, all part of their algorithm yes. to come up with a value. Yeah. Yes. And the argument that you're making is none of that should matter, uh, at least in theory, and which is, makes the exosome test uh, uh, different because though we still have to put in information, you know, uh, you know, elevated PSA and so forth. I don't think we have to put the value of PSA, but it does ask um, if if the reason is for elevated P- PSA, which is, of course it is. Uh, right. th- th- there's no other, right? So that's... Uh, uh, right. Uh, uh, but that I think that's it. That's all that I have to fill out for exo for an exo for, test for exo. Um, again, I haven't filled out a test form myself, but I'm pretty sure you just have to put in the patient relevant information. We don't require a PSA value at all. In fact, most of the right. many of the tests, uh, we don't get anything filled out on the PSA. We, as long as the doctor is using it for our inclusion criteria, that that's their decision how they use it. We don't ask for it. And I think to come back to what you said before, the, the really important thing, the way I think of it is if you have a test performance that goes to a certain level and it's all genomically driven, such as in the exodx prostate test, then you know exactly what the performance is based on just, for instance, in our case, these three genes. But if you're looking at another test, if it's select DX, for example, uh, because we just talked about them, and your clinical features come seven eighths of the way up to the performance, and then your genomic features, your two markers, add just a slight layer of value on top of that. Then mm. most of the performance of the test comes from the clinical information. And I find this mm. on a lot of tests where clinical features it's not widely appreciated because there's not a lot of people who can go through the data in in a deep way. But when the, the folks that do, I think, understand when you go th- when you have the time and and the expertise to go through a lot of these studies, it's really critically important to know that your test is that the value you're getting from your test is not really essentially mostly coming from clinical information you have, and and that's yeah, and the that frustrating thing for. Sorry, the, no, I was going to say no, no. the frustrating thing for clinicians is. So I've had a scenario of, <laughs> I've had the scenario, the clinical scenario of you doing two tests, because I'm trying to help the patient be really comfortable with their decision. Uh, and in many cases, is okay. Um, I I I don't want to do a biopsy, but I want as much information as possible to determine um, if if I need one or not. So I would do a let's say an exo test and a 4K. And I oftentimes I just that just opened up a can of worms because there was a a disparity in in outcomes. So the 4K would say, yeah, you know what, we we need a a biopsy, and the exo would say, no, you know, or vice versa. Right. 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 Um, what? So along those lines, has there ever been a head to head study to see which one performed better, select the X versus exo, or any one of these? There have been head-to-heads in the literature, not with XODX. There's been head-to-heads mm-hmm. um, with, uh, I believe, uh, I want to say Select and Phi or 4K and Phi. There's never been, and those are always done by individual physicians who are getting multiple tests in their clinic on the same patient. Yeah. Um, but I always, when somebody says to me, I, you know, I've done your test and another test, or I did these other three tests, and they don't always agree. 
you know, I'm of the opinion that I'm not surprised and I'm not sure why there's an expectation they should agree because you have three tests that are driven yes. by different factors that have different performance metrics. So undoubtedly, if you're getting uh, discordant results, one must be right based on what you would find and one or two wouldn't be. But it's it's because the tests are developed to different, in my opinion, levels of evidence. And they're if they're driven by clinical features versus not driven by clinical features, clinical features will drive the answer you get in tests that are based on those. And if you have something that's not incorporating clinical features, then and I think that goes back to the importance, the strength of a test that's independent is giving you information you didn't have. Now, the way to do this would be to have all the test companies, uh, various companies come together and do that. And in the tissue-based world, they talked about that for years, but uh, I've never actually seen anyone actually do it. Um, Yeah, I don't think it's, um, uh, there would be a loser in that, and I don't think anybody wants to lose I think uh, in, that's in, a, in such a scenario. I think that's the, the just, that's that's correct. It, uh, you know, I yeah. I think that I'm perfectly comfortable having that evaluation. I think you know what helps me feel comfortable in that is that you know when our test is that's another difference with a lot of tests that are commercially available. Um, a lot of tests when they're initially developed and validated, when you look at their original studies, have patients that are not a homogenous, pure, hard to understand population. And by that, I mean, the PSAs are all less than 10. They're all coming in for either initial or for prior negative, but not both. Uh, So in our original validation studies, which were very critical, uh, everybody had PSAs less than 10 in our validations. Um, They were coming in for initial biopsy. And that's the hard to understand group We've kept everything very homogenous. If you look at other uh, validation studies that are out there, sometimes you have really high PSAs. I've seen validation studies, 25, 50 nanograms per mil of PSA. And when you find, Mm -hmm. when your test is right about finding high-grade cancer there, it's not a surprise because you're much more likely to be at risk with a super high PSA. So... Uh, I think I think that's also important as well as looking at the original study design of various tests. So going back to the patient clinical setting, <clears throat> the cutoff when so when you do a PIA epi test, exosome uh, DX test to determine do I really need a prostate uh, a biopsy? The cutoff number is 15.6. Right? Yes, sir. So that would suggest that if the number is less than that, let's just say for argument's sake, you know, nine, uh, then there's a low probability of that person having a Gleason 7 or higher. If that number is higher than 15.6, there's a higher probability. But the, the range in terms of the epi score is between 1 and 100. 15.6 is on the lower end. At what point... Is there, in other words, as, as the number goes higher, is there much like higher probability? So if the patient score is a 17, should we worry? Should we say, okay, you, 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 I, and in my world, it, it would depend on many other factors and PSA velocity and things like that would make a difference. But let's just say just epi score alone, um, P, uh, that score is a, just slightly higher. What is it telling us versus, you know, a 20, a 30, a 50, a 80 in that score? No, I think that's a great question. And uh, there's a lot to unpack there. Right? But I think the the way to start is to say that how, we often get the question, how is that 15.6 cut point or threshold determined? And mm. the validation of that cut point or the, the validation of, of that particular point, 15.6, was determined by where two key metrics, performance metrics, were 90% or better. And that would be the negative predictive value, which is when you, as a physician, tell your uh, patient with a negative, with a, with a low risk result, how unlikely they are to find a Gleason 7 or higher tumor on biopsy. Um, and that's the negative predictive value. And then mm-hmm. the sensitivity about capturing patients with high-grade cancer above the cut point. How many do you mm-hmm. capture? 
So it's at 15.6 that both the negative predictive value and sensitivity are over 90%. And that's how it was determined. But from a, if you get a test report back and you have a score of 14, it will tell you epi low risk category. If you get a score of 17, you'll say high risk. But what's mm-hmm. the actual risk between those two patients? Well, not that much because mm. these tests, whether it's our test or another test, are continuous risk assessments. And the threshold has been selected because that's where you can provide and cl- make claims about test performance. So how do you treat the patient who has a score of 14 and is low and a 17 who's high? And I believe that although the test report will come back low or high for that patient, you know, every, every report says use the EPI score in the context of what else you know about the patient. And so as you move above the cut point, we know from the published data that the risk does increase as you go further up the EPI scale. Um, and I'll talk about that in just a second, but the way you use the uh, information, I think, around the cut point is to look at everything you know about the patient. Are there other risk factors um, for sure, that? Sure, and the, M- tar- um, the MRI is really a useful. Uh, that the uh, what newest technology that we have now is the three T MRI, which I think it helps as well. And and so so we look at the at the totality for sure. But you know, this is a patient. Let's just say Epi seventeen you know, Pyrat score three, which is like somewhere in the middle, you know, PSA for uh, the same patient, 52 years old. And in this case, PSA is a 3.5. So it, it, you know, and, and they really, you know, they was like, I don't want to, I don't want to do a biopsy. So this is the, uh, you know, uh, it, well, what I do clinically in that scenario is like, look, this is what you have. It's up to you to make an informed decision, but this is what it is. Yes, there's some ambiguity here. Um, there is some risk. Are you risk tolerant or not? Or blah, 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 based on this, because if it was an epi of 50 and a pirate of four or five, and then we're not even having this discussion. But is that, you know, is that middle group that sometimes I'm like, ah, oh, I'm scratching my head. And it's like, no, I, 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 I agree. And, and that's true. And you, you point out a great example, Pyrads 3, 52-year-old man, epi score 17. But uh, I, the way I look at it is that even with, uh, there's nothing clear cut in a, you know, as, to your point, if you have an epi score of 50, that's certainly, there's not as much discussion. And this, of course, goes back to how the physician counsels the, the patient. But I think that if you look at layering these different risk assessment methods together, then collectively, even though there's not a a smoking gun one way or the other, there's a lot of independent perspective. In case you mentioned, we know that PIRADS 3s, I want to say something like 60% are not concerning in a Mm PIRAD 3 group just Mm -hmm. off the top of my head. And now you have an EPI score of 17, which is while it's high risk, it's not super high risk. It's like two points above the cut point. So a clinician is going to use this, um, use this information and layer it together to make the best possible uh, guidance for the patient. But I think the way that I look at it is both the MRI and the biomarker have now given you more information than you had before. And so you're making a much more informed decision. It's not sure. perfect, but you're doing the best that the available information will give you. A hundred percent, a hundred percent. So w- what would you say is the, again, we're, 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 we're not talking about their MRI or even their PSA, just the epi score. Where would you say, look, once is after, once is after, you know, higher than X number, would you say there's an absolute chance in medicine and science, nothing is absolute. I get it. I know that's, what, but let's just say, what is that number that where there's like almost an absolute chance that there is a, either a Gleason seven or higher? What's that score? Well, I, you know, I can't give you a straightforward answer to that, but I, it, because there isn't one, but let me explain it this way. We know that below the 15.6, that the negative predictive value for finding a grade group two or higher tumor, uh, which is a, a Gleason three plus four or higher tumor, 
is 91, we're 91% certain when we tell the individual that you wouldn't find one. Not that you don't have one, that you wouldn't find one. Um, and the 97% negative predictive value for a worse tumor, so we pray group three, four plus three uh, tumor or higher. So below the 15.6, while it's not 100% and nothing is, it's much better than the clinical information that you currently have. At the same time, when you go up above the scale, we have to remember that you're already having this test because you're trying to make a biopsy decision, which means that you've already fulfilled the profile for being concerned or your physician's concerned enough to run the test because you're considering biopsy. And we know that the test does increase uh, from a linear relationship from 30 to about 50. Once it hits 50, anything from a score of 50 and higher um, is still about a 50-50 probability. And we'll be having some new test reports coming out early in 2024 that are actually going to provide that sort of data for you. uh, So even above 50... If that score is 52, there's still a 50% chance that that could be a, f- a false positive. So this, that that person may have a Gleason 6 and nothing higher. Right. And that's it. Yes. Or, or 70. And let me explain how that works. Um, it's we're at the limitation of the method you use to assess the accuracy of the testing. The All of these tests that are commercially available are all based on biopsy. And that's the considered the gold standard. But we understand that biopsy uh, is does not find cancer a significant percentage of the time. So when you don't find, with, when let's say you have a score of 50 or 60 or 70 uh, with the epi test in particular, and you don't find something, you don't know whether it's because the test is wrong or because the biopsy did not find whatever is cor- causing that signal. And if if you do the thought experiment where we knew that the test was perfect based on radical prostatectomy where we took to the, the prostate out and it was 100% perfect at finding and, and not finding sensitive and specific, we would still be limited by the biopsy. That test would not look perfect, it would still look like it's not finding stuff. So we never know when you get a high risk, what we're saying with the high risk results is you were already uh, at risk for having a biopsy because of an elevated PSA. And there's nothing to dissuade us from that because you've got a high risk result. And then the higher the result, the higher the probability, but that doesn't guarantee you'll find something. Now, interesting, interesting. Yeah, if I could just add one layer of point to yeah, that. Yeah, sure. You know, it's mm-hmm. interesting in our early validation studies, to your point, when we had some of these scores that were really high, but you only found a uh, great group one, Gleason six on biopsy, which had a high epi score. We considered those in our original validation study when that happened to be a false positive result uh, because we said it would be high, great cancer, but you only found Gleason six. We published another study um, about two years Were ago. Were they missing a, a bigger cancer? Well, in that we biopsy? Found, well, maybe, yes, because what we found is that some of the patients from those early data sets actually went on to surgery to a radical prostatectomy, and we were able to access them. Um, and in that paper, what you would find is that a number of the patients we said were false positives because you only found grade group one disease, Gleason 6, actually were higher grade on radical prostatectomy. Right. And so in that case, the epi test was wrong. Uh, the epi test was right. But originally, we published that those were wrong results because it was based on the biopsy. So that just sure, sure. sort of emphasizes that when you get a negative result with a very high epi score, um, we don't know if the test is right or wrong because we don't know whether it, the biopsy is right or wrong. Right, exactly. Uh, our audience, uh, we've spoke about it before, but uh, you know, part of the conversation is that um, one of the concerns with physicians is under uh, under sampling, right? Which means that you know they get, um, you know, if you do a hundred cores of a prostate, you're only getting one percent of the whole prostate gland on average, right? So it's very hard to get every little spot. Uh, the MRI targeted biopsy much better than just ultrasound. So we're, we're heading in the right direction. Um, um, I'm super excited. Um, yeah, well, 
I guess I'm not a, I was gonna say as a scientist, you don't want to get too excited about anything, but I'm not really a, I'm a clinician. Uh, <laughs> um, there's this micro ultrasound that they're studying that where you can see even more. So now when you combine it at NYU, we're studying it. When you combine this really good micro type of ultra called micro, micro ultrasound combined with uh, MRI, you can see things even better. So I think I'm cautiously optimistic for the future and where everything is going in terms of finding the cancer that you're trying to find. Um, all right. So the way exosome works right now is I have a PSA that's concerning. Um, I want to do this test to see if I, if, if, if a biopsy is the right thing for me. I've been thinking out of the box for uh, a, a few, almost all year in such a way. I'm also trying to perhaps lower their chance of if we already know that a patient, you know, from a biopsy has low risk disease, is on active surveillance. Typically, the protocols is biopsy every year. That could be every several years, once a year for three years, four years, depending on what the physician's trying to do. I, I, I don't want to keep going through these biopsies. So, in theory, and I know this is not what it's there for right now or approved for right now, in theory, can it be helpful? So you get a baseline epi, uh, uh, epi score, uh, exo DX score, right? You have a number there. And then a year later, when they're about to do another biopsy, you get another number. And if that number keeps going above 15.6, maybe that's it. But can, it, can that number go below 15.6? And then you say, and, and I know we... There's a lot of gray here with everything I'm saying because then nothing, none of this is approved. And, you know, the only really way of knowing if um, the pants have gotten worse or not is through biopsy. But let's just say, again, person, very motivated. I don't want a biopsy. I'll take my chances. Can we use the, 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 the exosome DX test to determine if you should absolutely do it or not that second subsequent biopsy a year later? So, yeah, so the way the test is uh, indicated for right now is to be considered that you can use it at the point in time when you're having a biopsy, even if it's a subsequent biopsy. So that's typically anywhere from a year to 18 months, two years. So what we talk about is using it when you're coming up on that subsequent decision for biopsy. Yeah. And that's, right. that's when, because the biology, you know, it, this is looking at the biology. When you're getting a liquid sample, regardless of the test, you're getting a snapshot in time of the biology. And so it, it's very possible that a year, two years later, the biology would be different. Um, so, but we don't recommend doing it, you know, every month, every three months, every six months. Right. We would do sure. it only when you're only when you're considering a new biopsy, which is at least a year. You know, I think. And 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 the reason why my work can be difficult, uh, particularly for scientists like you, be, is because I'm all about the multi the, the the multi variables to create a micro environment that's hostile to cancer, right? I want to put all the variables in. You right. guys are trying to limit variables to see what's the mechanism and pathway, and I'm saying no, we need it all, right? Right. So. What's interesting to me so far, this is a completely anecdotal and completely, I tell my patients, this is, I am, you're my guinea pig right now. And I have, I'm just, this is outside the box thinking where they're an active surve surveillance. I get a baseline exo. I put them in an aggressive lifestyle intervention protocol that involves physical exercise, very prescriptive diet, blah, 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 certain supplements. And I've seen I've seen a drop, a significant drop. Where let's just say uh, one case is like you know in the twenties, and then subsequent after and they're in active surveillance a year later, it's like a, a, a eight. So I think that there is, and I'm digging deeply a little bit more as to what are the possibilities of what's happening from a biological perspective. With but I think that something is very interesting there. I've always said I know lifestyle medicine can have uh, anti-cancer effects. I'm always, always very careful. I've been, I've been doing this for over 20 years, but for the first time, I'm saying there's anti-cancer benefits, anti-prostate cancer benefits with lifestyle. Before, I used to say, well, it helps with you know uh, lowering side effects of ADT, overall quality of life while you have cancer. Now I'm saying, time out. 
based on a lot of basic science data and even and human data on exercise and things, there's something happening. There's a, so there's an anti-cancer aspect to lifestyle. It, is that remotely possible, even if you can't say it with a high level of uh, that? With, if you do certain things, whatever those certain things are, that there's less of these um, prostate cancer related genes because there's probably regression. Uh, um, is that remotely possible? I know this is a, a you know, it's, for, for the years. answer is I don't know. I yeah. would, but I would point back to, you know, one of the beauties about the validation studies we've done across thousands of patients at this point is that, you know, we didn't gate people by their exercise or these are very robust studies because we had a very wide net uh, for people to be at various levels of activity, of uh, vitamins. We didn't rule anybody out for that. Sure, to sure. do the kind to answer the question that you're talking about, I, we'd have to, I guess, do a study where we compared people who were having some sort of vigorous exercise as opposed to more like myself, sedentary. Uh, people and, and then <laughs> see what we can observe. Yeah, uh, um, I, I I tell you that I um, I'll, I will present to you guys uh, my clinical findings once I have a couple of more people uh, and before and afters because I I think it's uh, quite fascinating what I'm yeah, what we, I'm looking at. Oh, I'd love to hear more about that off uh, when we talk separately. Yeah. Is there any other out of the box way of uh, outside the box thinking to use uh, the exo test? Um, um, you know, because so the range has to be between two and ten PSA. How about fifteen PSA, where we know that he has a big gland, and that's why that's called. Is is that a reasonable thing to do? So we leave that up to yeah. So for specifically for PSAs, you know, uh, that are higher than ten, and and men who are age fifty, you know, it's a good place to point out the test does work in men who are younger than fifty. I've run into occasionally people think the test somehow stops working at 50 and it doesn't work over 10. Those parameters were based on guidelines at the time the test was developed, where there was this homogenous zone where we needed help and, and guidelines had men at that time 50 and older. And that's how that specific inclusion criteria was defined. But having said that, the initial validation study we published in the journal of the American Medical Association had a small number of men who went from 10 to 20 nanograms per mil. They weren't part of the validation, but we did look at epi performance there and showed that it worked in that, that small group of men. Hmm. So even though the claims are very specific to 10, I know that there are doctors who have patients they worry about at 11 or 12. And, you know, we don't collect PSA, but um, and all we do is make the specific claims and inclusion criteria, and then uh, and then doctors will use it where they're concerned to use it. But those are the specific criteria that we make the claims on. But we do have some preliminary data in our early studies with PSAs up to twenty, and that can be found in the JAMA uh, article, validation article. Um, and uh, then is that the as, one that uh, uh, McKiernan is the primary author, Jane, uh, Jim McKiernan? Yeah, uh, Dr. McKiernan uh, is a primary author on both that initial validation and a subsequent validation in European neurology as well. Um, so, and I think he's also on several more studies that are, are not as relevant to the discussion today. But um, in, in addition, out of the box thinking, you know, we use exosomes internally for research, uh, for considering new tests in multiple different disease states. We've published, uh, we've put out some data and press releases on Sjogren's disease, mm -hmm. uh, where we collect, I believe, the exosomes and saliva. So we're actually a world leader in looking at how exosomes provide clinical benefit to a variety of disease states. A, a, Perhaps interesting to your audience is we just published another paper with NASA. We've been working with NASA for many, many years mm. um, and looking at uh, in this most recent paper, there is um, lot, no gravity causes an ocular syndrome, uh, which we're measuring using exosomes in, in concert with NASA to hopefully better understand for prolonged uh, flights 
into mm. Mars and so forth about how to address these kinds of medical issues. Um, so Fascinating. Okay. we do a lot of this stuff. Uh, and if you're interested in any of the papers, I can provide those to you, but we're looking at a for now, of things. uh, uh, for now, uh, I, I, I'm trying to, I'm trying to catch up just with the prostate cancer literature still. So <laughs> as, 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 so as you guys keep uh, publishing uh, on that, uh, certainly, uh, keep me posted, but th- you know, thank you for, it's pretty remarkable how the, um, the, the multipurpose use of, of, of exosomes, you're right. Even, uh, we might be contemp- uh, contemporary in age, but I certainly don't remember other than very basic science as it relates to exosomes. It's amazing what we can do with it now. Um, any final thoughts, Jason? First of all, thank you so much for coming on. I think this was um, kind of very useful. I think it's useful for the practitioner who are um, trying to figure out what to do with their patients and how to use uh, such a test. I think it's really um useful for the audience, the general lay people in the audience, the patient, and so that they, um, uh, the goal, you know, the goal is always for patients to become proactive in their decision making, um, as opposed to, um, you know, uh, whatever you want to do, doc, uh, which is, um, was the way for a long time. Certainly my father was whatever you want to do, doc, a type of person. I think the paradigm has changed and they want to be proactive and empowered, uh, and turn and, and in the decision making of, you know, what to do. So I think that um, many of the people will have better questions at least to ask the urologist about a test like uh, the exosome DX test. So thanks so much, Jason. Any final words? And if there's um, a, a way of uh, anyone getting in touch with you, you have a website, I don't know, or do you have anything? Sure. Um, well, the uh, website is, uh, I think it's exosomedx.com or exosome diagnostics dot com um i can provide you with an email i guess that the mm-hmm. people can reach me if they want i'm happy to answer questions to the best of my ability um i think that this is i've been impressed in my time in prostate cancer i think the future for men who are dealing with this disease is so much better than when i started There's a lot more tools you can see when we talk about all these things people are really trying to to drive things forward for for men with prostate cancer. And I want to thank you for your time and allowing me on the call today. It's my pleasure. Really informative. Thank you so much for coming on, Jason. Um, We'll we'll talk soon. Uh, So this is Dr. Gio signing off. I'll talk to you all next time.